Um, guys, as we look at John 15, I mostly want to focus on verse 1 today. And uh, I believe in verse 1, Jesus is placing two tensions that is needed for the rest of that parable to actually come into fulfillment, come to that place where we will bear fruit, we will bear excellent fruit, lasting fruit that will glorify our Father in heaven. And the first tension you see is, it's almost like two spiritual building blocks that he's putting in place before he starts building into the rest of the parable. The first one is he calls himself the true line, meaning it's when we abide in Jesus, when we submit our lives fully onto the person of Jesus, that we position ourselves for trueness of life, for kingdom life to flow into us and also through us. And um, it's interesting that he will call himself the true line, meaning whatever is positioned outside of the person of Jesus is actually false. And it's actually in a sense saying that whenever we abide to anything outside of Jesus, and submit to anything we are submitting to a false life and a life that's not able to sustain us, that we need to be submitted and abided into the very source of life, as the book of Acts would say. The second tension that Jesus is putting down is this, he's pointing towards a relationship with the Father, where there's an engaging in a relationship. We are children that are being brought up and actually um, honoring a headship over us and a fatherhood over us that's being exercised by God the Father. And he says, my Father is, is the vine dresser. He is the one that's the God. So we see these two tensions where Jesus says, it's okay to abide in me in a relationship, but you also need to abide in relationship to my Father. And those two tensions will bring about the ability to bring forth fruit, lasting fruit, excellent fruit that will glorify my Father in heaven. And I want you guys to think like a greenhouse effect. Um, you know, when there's, when, the, when there's the perfect tension between all the elements, Whatever is placed in that environment will come to the full expression, the maximum potential of growth that is um, placed within that particular plant or tree. And for us it's exactly the same. It's when we find the perfect tension between these two relationships, giving our lives unto Jesus, fully submitting unto Him, but also then submitting ourselves as children submit themselves unto a father, we find the potential to bring forth kingdom life to the full expression and the ability and potential towards what God has placed within us. And um, I think for most of us, the first tension is, is easier than the second one. It's easier to surrender our lives and submit unto the person of Jesus, but most of us struggle with the second one. But Jesus says, but you have to place yourself in that position that he's the father of your life. And I think the reason we struggle with that, and that's the one I just want to focus on this morning, is um, most of us um, are so concerned about COVID-19 and the effects it will have for generations to come. But there's a bigger epidemic that's already within the world, according to psychologists, that's been there for the last generation, and that has even more intense effects on our lives. And this epidemic is called the fatherless generation, where a lot of us has been brought up either in a fatherless home or in an abusive relationship with a father that's not a Christian or, um, yeah, they have no idea when it comes to the ways of the Lord, of the Lord and, and, and modeling that onto the next generation. So what we have is we have, we have a, a fruit of that where when we come to Jesus, when we submit our lives to Jesus, for, for most of us we, we can say, yes, I can do this, I can surrender my life. And then Jesus says his only intention with putting your life under the fatherhood of the ultimate father and, and abiding in me that you will be able able to come into the full potential that God has on your life. And I think because of that, some of us struggle with a godly definition of how it looks like. And even, you know, we might be scared. What is the fix of that? Because my experience 
you know, I would direct it. When I did that with my natural father, that wasn't a good experience. But how do I, so how do I do it in a biblical context? How do I do it in a way that's pleasing unto the Lord? And what will be the effects of when I engage in this relationship of being a son, being a daughter, and allowing the father to exercise his headship? So maybe just firstly look at biblical context. What is the positioning for us to move into that relationship? And in 1 Peter 3 verse 6, you see the following thing. And it's speaking about Abram, and I want you guys to think about Abram as being the father of a household, uh, being the father of his household. And there was a posture carried within the household towards the father. You know, that would include his wife, but also his children. There was a posture that was um, exercised, a model that was pleasing unto the Lord. And today we are called the household of God, and he's still our father. And then we need to have the same posturing towards him and I believe that's why the Lord spoke it that's why he allowed it to be written into his word because it, it's to serve him as an example of us of how to honor each other and enter into that relationship properly so it says in 1 Peter 3 verse 6 it says it was thus that Sarah obeyed so there was a posture and a desire in the household to obey the father of that house. Come what may, we will obey the father of the house. Then it goes on and says, following his guidance and acknowledging his headship over her. So there was a desire not only to obey, but to say, Father, lead us. We want to follow your guidance and we want to acknowledge Lord, your, your headship over us. Goes on and says that she called him Lord, Master, Leader, and Authority. And in a sense, the father of the house in biblical context was placed in the position where he was Lord. He could exercise lordship, he could exercise his mastery, he could lead the household. Because they had a heart to follow his guidance. And he was placed in a position by the children of that household to say, exercise your authority over our lives. And when we take that position, in Proverbs 1 verse 7, that is called the fear of the Lord. In the message it says, it is the bowing of our knees unto God. And this is this posture where there's a heart that's desiring to obey God. There's a heart that's desiring to follow his guidance, to honor his lordship over us and give him the position, willfully to give him the position to be lord, to be master, to be leader, to exercise authority. And that is what Proverbs describes as the fear of the Lord, the bowing of the knee to God. It says that is the beginning of knowledge. Now this knowledge of Proverbs is not speaking about God coming to fill your head with a lot of revelation, the ability to memorize the Bible in different translations. It's not speaking about that. That word knowledge is, is something that surpasses our knowledge. And Paul writes about it where he says that you will get to a place where there's intimacy with the Lord that surpasses your knowledge. And this is what Proverbs is describing when we take that position onto the Lord. So that those two words that says it's the beginning of knowledge means it is the beginning of intimacy, true intimacy. That's what that word means. It's the beginning of true intimacy with our Father. When we willfully place ourselves in a position where we define ourselves by that position as being children and we give unto the Lord His headship, His fatherhood, and we give unto him the ability to exercise it over our lives. That is the beginning of intimacy according to the word of true intimacy. Now, I want to ask you guys, I don't know how many of you have memories where there would have been intimate times of your father. And in your heart, if you are honest, those were the times where you would engage in a, in a um, conversation with him. But it was, it was the times in your heart where you would honor his hatred. There was a there was an honoring of his authority. There was a there was a willingness that he would lead you in wisdom. Now I can remember many times like that with my dad standing next to the fire, uh, where there was in, in that moment where there was 
no pretending, no uh, offense. There was nothing that I held against it. It was just this place of, of, of honoring his headship and uh, desiring to hear his wisdom, desiring to lead me in certain areas and to exercise his authority. And those were sweet moments where there were moments of intimacy. And in that space, my father would share his most intimate times in his life with him. And in Proverbs 1 verse 23, in the message, I believe that's what God is longing for. He says, when we take this posture and this intimacy, he says in verse 23, I will pour out my spirit upon you, the Lord says, and I will tell you of everything that I desire. And uh, isn't that what normally would happen with us in our natural setting with our dads? When we engage in those times where there's a, a positioning to obey, there's a positioning to follow, there's a positioning to acknowledge his headship. In those times, our natural thoughts would, would start pouring out onto us. Dreams and desires and even sometimes telling us how much they love us. And, and in a sense, just establishing us in that reality and I want to I want to just end with this that the Lord does see that willingness to obey that willingness to follow he sees it as a position of us declaring that we love and I think sometimes you know just thinking of, of our natural examples that would have been the times when our father would share because us taking that position would make you know, would make him feel like man my my son loves me, my daughter loves me, and therefore I'm going to share my heart on to them. And um, in Romans 8 verse 29 in the message, and I want to end with this, it says, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him, those who take that position of making him the headship, you know, acknowledging him as the father, that posture that I talked about now, um, now God looks at them and he says, those are the ones that will truly love me. And because of that, I've decided to shape their lives. And it goes on and it says, within the same shape as my son. So in those places, in context of John 15, those are the times, you know, when God prunes, when he cleans. It's those intimate times. But we need the tension. We need to find a balance in that tension. Where yes, we need to say yes to Jesus. We need to submit to Jesus with all our lives. But we need to position ourselves in this faith journey with God in a place that we are sons and daughters of the living God. And we need to allow Him to exercise hatred and authority. And we need to come with a posture that cries out to our Father and that says unto Him, Father, we love you. That's why we want to obey. We want to follow father we want to acknowledge we want you to be the lord of our lives we want you to be the master the leader and exercise your authority and in those times the father will come and he will establish true intimacy in those times and in that intimacy he will start to mold and shape and form us so that we will be conformed into the image of his son transformed into that image and ultimately bear fruit that will glorify our Father in